For many of you, Greg Grandin really does need an introduction, I think. Uh, you've heard, heard his name, uh, and you've read his stuff in The Nation, Counter, Counterpunch, Z Magazine, and others. Um, and you probably also know that he deals with the topics of revolution, popular memory, U.S.-Latin American relations, photography, genocide, human rights, and the list does go on. Um, he's a teacher, he's an author, he's a scholar. Uh, something you may not know is that he, in 90, 1997 and 98, he was a member of the UN-sponsored Truth Commission in Guatemala, uh, which brought, uh, unearthed a number, uh, a number of the atrocities that occurred there and uh, tried to bring closure to that process. Now, uh, his work does focus on Central America and Guatemala in particular. Um, I'm going to mention just a couple of his publications, which, which are, are key. Um, and excellent publications, I might add. Uh, the Blood of Guatemala, A History of Race and Nation. And this won the Brace uh, Wood Award of the Latin American uh, Studies Association um, for most outstanding book in English on Latin America. So that's a must read. Uh, more recently, The Last Colonial Massacre, The Latin American Cold War and Its Consequences, which in explores partly Mayan involvement in Guatemala's Communist Party. And then the newest work, which is called Empire's Workshop, Latin America and the Rise of the New Imperialism, which he'll be talking about tonight. And um, is it true that you have some uh, uh, volumes that you brought with you or not? Okay, okay, okay. okay. So I thought, I thought maybe they'd be available tomorrow, but uh, okay. Uh, Amazon.com? <laughs> okay. And I, I'm just going to conclude by talking about a few of the courses that Greg teaches at NYU, which I think are, are pretty telling. He teaches a course in Terror and Memory in Latin America, The Roots of Revolution, Latinos in North America, and Lat Latin America in the Cold War. And so with, I, I think I'm going to stop with that and let, let uh, Professor Grandin uh, have his time. Anyway, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Oh, it is really bright up here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me. And um, thank you, Joel and, and Russell. It's great. It's great to be here. It's my first time in in, uh, in Western Michigan. Um, it's an it's an exciting time for people who write on and study Latin America. There's a lot going on. Um, coming out of the kind of neoliberal 1990s, starting in late 1998, and starting with uh, Hugo Chavez's uh, election, uh, and then continuing through uh, Brazil and Bolivia and Argentina, one country after another, has um, has. I don't want to just I don't want to say turn left, but but ha has has emerged that so that sought to challenge or question the Washington Consensus, the kind of free market orthodoxy, that in many ways was imposed on Latin America after after the end of the Cold War. Um, what I want to talk about, and, and we have elections coming up soon in Ecuador, maybe uh, within, within a week, and then, and then Nicaragua in November, and then a runoff in Brazil, so the, the trend is in some ways continuing. Um, but what I'd like to talk about now is, is, is the rise of a different social movement, one that in many ways is much more consequential for our, our immediate lives here in the United States, and that's the, the rise of the, uh, the new right in the United States and, and, how, and how its rise was, was uh, in many ways refracted and, and, and um, channeled through the experience of U.S. foreign policy in Latin America. Um, it's hard to believe that, it, but it was, it was 20 years ago, uh, this November coming up, that, that a Lebanese uh, magazine reported that Ronald Reagan's White House had uh, secretly sold high-tech missiles and, and other military equipment to Ayatollah Khomeini's Iran, which violated an arms embargo in, against that country and it contradicted Ronald Reagan's uh, pledge that he would never deal with governments that sponsor terrorism. Um, Follow-up investigations uncovered what the New York Times called an extensive foreign policy initiative largely based in private hands, one which uh, most famously diverted the profits from that sale, uh, uh, the sale of high-tech missiles and other, and other military equipment to Iran to fund the Nicaraguan Contras. Uh, 
uh, as part of Reagan's larger Central American policy. Uh, that, set, that funding, that diversion, diversion of money broke another law, this one banning military aid to the anti-Sandinista uh, guerrillas. You know, like the Watergate scandal, the Iran-Contra affair started out as a small back page story in a newspaper only to explode into a major constitutional crisis. Uh, yet unlike Watergate, which yielded in many ways a broad consensus regarding the dangers of unchecked uh, executive presidential power, what became known as Iran-Contra uh, produced no closure. At first, U.S. viewers in the United States were transfixed by the scandal, with the, particularly by the te televised congressional hearings that were broadcast uh, the following summer. It gave them a glimpse of a, a very kind of closed, cabalistic world of of, uh, made up of rogue U.S. and Israeli intelligence agents, mercenaries, neoconservative intellectuals, Arab sheiks and sultans, uh, drug runners, anti-communist businessmen, Cuban exiles, people like Felix Rodriguez, uh, even the Moonies. Um, but they eventually grew, grew bored, you, uh, viewers and, and, and you, uh, the U.S. public grew bored of the multiple investigations into the scandal into the affair, which got bogged down in procedural issues, trying to prove that Reagan or his top advisors had specific knowledge of, 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 of specific criminal activity, prior knowledge of specific criminal activity. But if the Democrats uh, failed to kind of wring a parable out of Iran-Contra, others have found it instructive, most notably uh, Dick Cheney today points to Iran-Contra not as a not as a less lesson, not as a caution against unchecked executive power, but but a blueprint for how to obtain it. And it turns out that that Cheney's chief of staff, David Addington, who who pundits today call Cheney's Cheney, and is kind of in many ways identified as the intellectual behind the uh, kind of the kind of power grab by the Bush administration on any host of issues, uh, kind of rethinking the Constitution to emphasize the, the privilege and prerogatives of the executive branch vis-a-vis -vis the Congress. David Addington, back in the 1980s, was Cheney's chief of staff when Cheney was in the Congress, and it was he who largely wrote the minority report to the Senate investigation into Iran-Contra. Now, at that time, the report was condemned as being way far out of the mainstream. Uh, it blamed not the National Security Council, which had brokered you know, Oliver North's National Security Council, which brokered the, the diversion of funds to the Nicaraguan Contras and, and all of the abuses that went with it. It blamed the Congress for what it called legislative hostage taking. Uh, now, it was out of, out, of, out of the mainstream in 1980s, but today it reads like uh, any run-of-the-mill Justice Department memo uh, outlining the legal basis of you know, take your pick any number of, of, of Bush, the Bush administration's wartime, but wartime policies from, the, from the, the doing away of habeas corpus to justifying torture to extraordinary rendition to wiretapping to, to you name it. Now, when recently asked about his role in, 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 in the strengthening of the executive branch, Dick Cheney pointed to this report, the Iran-Contra Minority Report, uh, which he described as very good in laying out a robust view of the president's prerogatives with respect to the conduct of foreign policy and national security matters. Now, Cheney and Addington, of course, are not the only uh, old Iran-Contra uh, Nicaraguan hands or Central American hands, which have, have been made it back, have resurfaced to help uh, George Bush fight the war on terror. Um, other Iran-Contra notables to, to have uh, re-emerged in recent years include Elliot Abrams, who today is, sits on the National Security Council. Uh, in, in the 1980s, he was Reagan's Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America, and he was kind of one of these first generation neoconservative intellectuals who appropriated the language of human rights in order to justify uh, uh, much of Reagan's policies in Central America. Uh, Otto Reich, a Cuban exile, who uh, I'll talk a little bit about him later, but in the, in the 1980s he presided over this extensive, what, what the Senate, uh, one, one Senate investigation I ran contra called a, a a covert operation run on domestic soil. Uh, John Negroponte, who today presides over the combined intelligence apparatus, 
post 9-11 kind of amalgamated uh, intelligence apparatus in the 1980s. He was the U.S. ambassador to Honduras where he worked with Oliver North and presided over, over uh, uh, parts of the, Ira the Contra War in Nicaragua. John Poindexter, uh, Robert Kagan, Michael Ledeen, and all these other kind of neoconservative intellectuals, even John Bolton, uh, the UN, uh, UN ambassador, Bush's ambassador to the UN in the 1980s. He was the just he was in the Justice Department where he uh, he uh, he um, he opposed. He kind of uh, fought off uh, attempts by the Congress to subpoena records related to Iran Contra. But I think the links between the current Bush administration's kind of post 9/11 expansive foreign policy, what what neoconservatives like to call a revolution in, in diplomacy, revolution in foreign policy, and Reagan's Central American policy in the 1980s are even more profound than the simple recycling of personnel. Uh, in recent number, in recent in recent year, in recent months, over the over the course of the last year, there's been any number of books uh, which have sought to take the measure of of the Bush administration's this or that constituency within the Bush coalition. There's uh, there's been, Bush, there's been books on, on the neoconservatives, there's been books on the, on, the, on the Christian right, there's been books on the militarists, but I think they all miss the one place where all of these different constituencies uh, first came together, and that, and that, was, and that was in Central America. Uh, in particular, uh, many of these books have tried to kind of account for this strange mix that makes up the Bush doctrine, this strange mix of realism, right, this kind of Real politic, uh, old, you know, return to just just great power uh, prerogative. The kind of an unapologetic assertion that it's Washington's right to use preemptive violence to respond to perceived threats, and 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 idealism, uh, not you know, a justification of that of that power and that right in ever more idealistic terms. That it's not just about defending our national interests, it's about ridding the world of evil in, George's, in, in Bush's terms. It's about, it's about bringing democracy, it's about kicking off a global democratic revolution. So this is kind of the moral core of the Bush doctrine. I think there's been uh, uh, this kind of mix of this, of this kind of what I, what, I, what I think of as kind of punitive idealism and, 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 and I think pundits and, and, and observers and commentators have been hard pressed to find, to understand where it comes from because it is very, uh, very uh, new for the Republican Party, and again, they they all miss the one place where 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 there was where where these different currents came together to, and that was in in Re Ronald Reagan's Central American Wars of the 1980s. Uh, again, it included not just the patronage of the Contras in Nicaragua, but of vicious counterinsurgent campaigns in Guatemala and El Salvador. Uh, in many ways, that policy can best be understood as a dress rehearsal for the gathering forces of, of the new right, kind of a dress rehearsal for what's going on now in the Middle East, the, the place where the coalition of neocons, uh, Christian evangelicals, uh, free marketeers, and nationalists that now stand behind George Bush's post-9-11 foreign, foreign policy first came together. It's where they had free reign to bring the full power of the U.S against a much weaker enemy in order to exercise the ghost of Vietnam and in so doing being, begin the transformation not just of, of U.S. diplomacy but of, of, of U.S. domestic culture as well. In 1981, Gene Kirkpatrick, who was, who was Reagan's, Central, uh, Reagan's ambassador to the U.N., remarked that uh, Central America is, quote, the most important place in the world for the United States. And so commentators at the time, observers at the time, were hard pressed to count for such a such an uh, evaluation, such an elevation of value. I mean, there was the Middle East, there was there was Asia, there was Eastern Europe, there was Russia. Uh, she called it critically important for U.S. interests. Uh, they were, people were also equally perplexed by Ronald Reagan's refusal to negotiate an end to what, by all all reasonable judgments were minor conflicts, uh, insurgencies in El Salvador and Guatemala and, and, uh, and a kind of left-wing nationalist regime in, in Nicaragua, uh, by, uh, by Reagan's re uh, willingness to pursue his objectives to the point of provoking a constitutional crisis, and by his insistence that, that support for allies responsible for the 
deaths and tortures of, of hundreds of thousands of people. Guatemala, 200,000 people were killed. Uh, Nicaragua, probably 30,000. Uh, in El Salvador, 60,000, all directly, directly at the hands of U.S. allies, U.S. and U.S. the forces that U.S. Uh, sponsored. That this support was a matter of principle of keeping faith with American ideals. I think it turns out that Central American's importance re resided exactly in its unimportance, uh, even as he acted with moderation in other areas of the world. Uh, Reagan could give the region to movement conservatives, the forces, the activists that brought him to power, with little fear of consequences. Uh, Central America had no consequential allies, unlike Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Uh, it had little uh, important resources. Uh, it was squarely within the United States' sphere of influence. Uh, so in many ways, their hard line, the hard line of the, of the new right, of the conservative movement, was a form of, of uh, wish fulfillment, of, of how they wished the United States would deal with other trouble spots. A staffer in Jeff, Jesse Helms' office, who was very a key, Jesse Helms was very key in, in vetting foreign policy appointments under Reagan, uh, remarked that, uh, you know, they can't have this, they meaning the, 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 the movement conservatives, the base, can't have the Soviet Union, the Middle East, or Western Europe, all are too important, so they've given them Central America. Now, Democratic and public opposition to Reagan's Central American policy, uh, which was very strong, always a majority in, in, all, in all polls, uh, proved to be a blessing in disguise for the Reagan revolution, for the gathering new right. It forced the White House to rely on its social base to execute its off-the-books foreign policy, it thus thickening the connection between the diverse co constituencies that made up the new right, diverse conservative groups. It created a dense network of, in of action intellectuals, political organizations, and social movements uniting mainstream conservatives with, with militants from the carnivalesque right. Urbane sophisticates such as Jean Kirkpatrick made common cause with uh, soldier of fortune mercenaries, sunbelt evangelical capitalists uh, like uh, Joseph Kors or evangelical capitalists that aren't from the sunbelt like Richard DeVos uh, that some of you may, may know, uh, the, the father. Uh, and end time is like Tim LaHaye, who long before he hit the bestseller list with his Left Behind series was hawking the Central American crusade to the evangelical rank and file. Now in Washington, the first generation of neoconservative intellectuals uh, in alliance with politicized Vietnam vets like Oliver North, who held second tier positions in the White House, created an interagency war party that allowed them to move forward with support for for, for, uh, for the Contras, despite congressional and State Department disapproval. Uh, in, the, uh, in the field, Reagan's Central American Wars reactivated CIA and defense counterinsurgent operations operatives who, who had been desk bound since the US had been kicked out of Southeast Asia, and it coordinated their work with private mercenaries, conservative, uh, often evangelical money men, again, DeVos, and a rising Christian fundamentalist movement. So even as the military high command was taking steps to prevent another Vietnam from happening by attempting to limit the, the use of US military power to clearly defined objectives, beginning to elaborate what would become known as the Weinberger and then the Powell doctrines, uh, civilian ideologues and militarists in Central America were pushing in the opposite direction. They were, they were, uh, they were in El Salvador. They were they were funding the largest nation building uh, operation, counterinsurgency, largest nation building counterinsurgency since Vietnam. And in Nicaragua, they were moving American diplomacy away from containment to rollback, advancing a vision of military power used not for specific ends, uh, but to launch what neoconservatives today call a global democratic revolution. Now, for the ascendant conservative movement, it wasn't, just, it wasn't enough just to rehabilitate militarism and project it into the third world and project it into Latin America. Uh, defeat in Vietnam, along with Watergate and inquiries into U.S. support and sponsorship of coups and death squads and covert operations and assassinations and military dictatorships, provoked a moral crisis, helping to spread a culture of uh, skeptical anti-militarism and, and, and dissent and political dissent. Uh, 
The task of the Reagan revolution, the task of the new right then, was to reestablish American diplomacy or American foreign policy on an ethical foundation or as how, how they understood an eth ethics or morality. And I think this is the most important and immediate roots of, of the Bush doctrine's uh, dangerous mix of realism and idealism that I laid out earlier. Now, commentators have had difficulty accounting for this Republican embrace of idealism in foreign policy, which uh, from Woodrow Wilson to John Kennedy had long been the property of the Democratic Party. Pundits correctly identify a rhetorical shift taking place uh, during Ronald Reagan's tenure, reflecting his efforts to restore America's pride and purpose after the melancholy 1970s. Yet they consistently ignore the one place where Republicans turned themselves into what neocons like to call hard Wilsonians, and that was in Central America. Before using human rights uh, in negotiations with the Soviet Union, before taking steps to promote democratic change in Eastern Europe, before nudging friendly dictators in the Philippines and South Korea to allow for free elections, uh, Reagan's White House in El Salvador co-opted the language of human rights from the Democratic Party to justify the patronage of what was effectively a death squad government. And in Nicaragua, the White House, the Reagan administration, radically transformed diplomatic protocol by demanding that the Sandinistas uh, embark on internal reform, that they, that, they, that they adhere to some standard of human rights, that the, that the, that the White House would, would decide what was, that they, that they not just not fund insurgents in Guatemala or El Salvador, but that they hold free elections. This was a, a, a radical break with past diplomatic protocol, which was just concerned with, with what governments did outside their borders. So this is, in, in, in many ways, you can kind of see this shift that, that now just that kind of underwrites Bush's post-9-11 foreign policy. And then in rhetorical terms, we just contrast Vietnam with Central America. In Vietnam, as the war progressed and American involvement both grew both more damned and, and more violent, idealism slowly drained out of Washington's public pronouncements. By the war's end, Nixon and, and his administration and members of administration and particularly Kissinger, rarely justified, if ever, the war in terms of promoting democracy, but rather by the need uh, to protect national security and to save face and to save credibility. In Central America, the exact opposite happened. In the face of mounting evidence of atrocities uh, by, at the hands, by the hands of US allies, followed by scandals associated with the Iran-Contra affair, Reagan and his fights with Congress consistently upped the ethical ante uh, he famously anointed the Contras to be the moral equivalent of America's founding fathers. Uh, who among us, he asked Congress in 1986, would tell these brave young men and women, your dream is dead, your democratic revolution is over, you will never live in a Nicaragua you fought so hard to build. It was Reagan who, who rehabilitated Abraham Lincoln as a, a kind of idealist icon for the Republican Party. Not just Abraham Lincoln, but also Thomas Paine. It was, Reagan, who had even had the nerve to class spiritual kinship with, with uh, Sandino, who the Sandinistas, you, many of you know, the Sandinistas were, you know, were named after and could trace that lineage back to. It was Reagan had the nerve to actually uh, identify and, and hold up Sandino as a true patriot of Nicaragua in his effort to demonize the Sandinistas. So by the end of the 1980s, the conservative movement, the new right, had, had achieved a remarkable revolution in, in, in the mechanics and the morals of American power. They both presided over an enormous military buildup and the rehabilitation of low intensity warfare into the third world. But for that revolution to take hold, uh, one important obstacle uh, still remained. Uh, it was described in 1984 by, by the Pentagon's legal advisor, William, William O'Brien, who complained of what he called, quote, the unrelenting anti-militarism of the American home front, unquote, whose distaste for things like torture and assassinations, quote, dead or wounded children, starvation as a means of con combat, continued to handicap Americans act Amer the United States' action in the world. More than any other 20th century conflict, Vietnam, the 1960s and 1970s, highlighted the porous border between foreign and uh, domestic policy, escalating protests, much of it linked to a reinvigorated internationalism uh, 
uh, not only helped end the war, but led to congressional and legislative measures that, that curbed the power of, of government security institutions, most notably the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. In what seemed like a remarkably short period of time, the, 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 um, the institutional pillars of society, the church, the Congress, the courts, newspapers, movies, the judiciary, uh, that had previously buttressed government legitimacy when it was now leaning against it, advancing what, what neoconservatives came to call a permanent adversarial culture. Now the backlash to these challenges uh, was broad and all-encompassing, and in many ways we're living in the society that this backlash created. Uh, it reached into every uh, nook and cranny of, of American politics and culture. Yet a key element of that backlash, the restoration of the power of the executive branch to wage unaccountable war, first took place in, in the fight, in the domestic fight over Reagan's Central American policy. Just as Hawks used Central America to go on the offensive abroad, they took the opportunity provided by the conflict to rehearse con uh, techniques to contain dissent at home in ways that, that continue to resonate uh, to this day. Uh, the Reagan revolution came to power in 1980, committed to rolling back all of the restrictions placed by Congress and Carter's Justice Department on the FBI and the CIA as well as the Warren Supreme Court's extension of, of civil liberties. It laid out a program that in many ways, remarkably, if you go back and read the Heritage Foundation's uh, documents, the kind they, put, they, they published a kind of mandate for change in 1980 to coincide with Reagan's uh, victory. I guess they published in 1981 to coincide with his inauguration. Uh, a remarkable program that in many ways foreshadows uh, the provisions today found in the Patriot Act and other post-9-11 initiatives to restructure the intelligence system. It especially called for a kind of breaking down the firewall between the FBI and the CIA and allowing for interagency file sharing between the two institutions and a limiting of constitutional rights. At the time, uh, just, just, just as Addington's minority report was too, too radical to implement or too radical to take seriously in the, mid in the late 1980s, uh, at the time, in the early 1980s, these reforms were too, were too outside the mainstream. So conservative organizations specifically called for a monitoring of solidarity organizations that opposed Ronald Reagan's Central American policy. Intelligence agencies, most notably the FBI, and the CIA again turned their attention to domestic dissenters. They carried out a far-reaching operation against church groups, against public policy foundations, human rights organizations, even congressional offices. Uh, their activity went well beyond surveillance to include the harassment of activists in, in their homes and their workplace. In many ways, it was a resurrection of COINTELPRO-style operations uh, that in the 1960s and 70s targeted the civil rights and anti-war movement. There's over 100 burglaries uh, of the homes of, of Central American solidarity activists that, 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 that went unexplained and uninvestigated. Uh, at the same time, the White House, uh, in order to tame an unruly press in Congress, established in 1983 a sophisticated public relations unit called uh, the Office of Public Diplomacy. It was headed first by Cuban exile Otto Reich, and then taken over by neoconservative intellectual Robert Kagan, the new office was staffed with specialists in psychological warfare dr uh, drawn from the CIA and the military. A congressional, a congressional investigation, as I mentioned before, described the office as a covert operation run on domestic soil, one which illegally used public funds uh, to manipulate public opinion. <clears throat> The Office of Public Diplomacy perfected many of the tactics that today go by the name of swift boating. It brought together the combined power of, of Madison Avenue public relations firms linked to the Republican Party, supposedly independent, new right, conservative organizations, uh, along with the executive branch to discredit not just the arguments of critics of Reagan's Central American policy, but the critics themselves uh, it managed to turn out from office a number of of Democrats who opposed uh, Reagan's Central American policy or prevent the elections of others and went after reporters and, uh, and, uh, and other journalists who, who, who were critical of, um, of, of, uh, of, what, of what the White House was doing in El Salvador and Nicaragua and Guatemala. Now the point of all of this uh, 
the, all this work of the Office of Public Diplomacy was, uh, was, was not to create a consensus for Reagan's policies, but to prevent an oppositional consensus, uh, such as what happened during the Re Vietnam War from forming, to overwhelm the public with disinformation and spin, carefully crafted spin. It was uh, through the Office of Public Diplomacy that foreign policy was reduced ever more into, into a series of emotionally laden talking points. The Sandinistas, for instance, were linked to any number of focus group tested world evils, religious persecutions, uh, drug running, the Red Brigades, the Basque Etta, the PLO, Libya, Arafat, Gaddafi, Ayatollah Khomeini, even the, even the Beidah Meinhof gang in, in Germany. Most of these claims were as false, but, but, but no less effective than, than those now 16 famous words in, in Bush's 2003 State of the Union address. Based, on, based, based uh, on what played well in polls and focus groups, again, these polls and focus groups were conducted by Madison Avenue public relations firms. And again, this foreshadows a lot of the work done by the Rendon Group in order to sell the war on terror and then the invasion of Iraq. Public diplomacy began to describe America's enemy in the third world and in Latin America and Central America, not as communist, but as terrorist, uh, linking the fight in Central America to the US's deepening involvement in the Middle East. And they also tried to drive a wedge between the Sandinistas and Jewish progressives, taking over public diplomacy in 1986 from, from Otto Reich. Robert Kagan recommended a distribution of, uh, of glossy reports that documented Sandinista anti-Semitism. They were, these, these reports were to be docu uh, formatted in, in, your own, in their own word style to quote key Jewish journalists and interreligious publications. So in many ways, that was also a kind of resurrection of the same kind of wedge issues that were used to uh, to um, divide uh, white progressives and, and Jewish progressives from the Black Panthers in the 1960s and 70s. But public diplomacy was, was, was designed not just to inspire, not just to, to create fear, but to inspire. It was through the office that Reagan began to insert into his rhetoric much of the lofty language he used to justify Central America. You could see a direct link between these polls and this kind of list of, of keywords that played well and, 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 how the, and how the language kind of filtered into the, the speeches of top administration officials, including uh, Ronald Reagan. It was here where revolution in the name of democracy became a marketing device. Again, much, much as we see going on today. Uh, but most importantly, in order to contain domestic dissent, uh, and domestic, counter domestic opposition, the White House mobilized its own evangelical base, its evangelical base. As part of the extensive Iran Contra network, Christian businessmen raised monies for, money for arms and funded the myriad, of, myriad organizations that worked closely with the White House to sway public opinion and congressional votes in favor of Reagan's wars. Uh, working closely with Oliver North, for example, Phyllis Shafley's. Uh, Eagle Forum sent, quote, freedom fighter friendship kits, unquote, to the Contras, which were complete with toothpaste and insect repellent and, and Bibles. Uh, a slew of newly formed Pentecostal and dispensationalist groups, uh, Gospel Crusades Incorporated, Friends of the Americas, Operation, Operation Blessing, World Vision, Harvesting in Spanish, uh, likewise shipped hundreds of tons of humanitarian aid to anti-communist allies in Central America. They established schools and health clinics and religious institutions. They broadcast radio uh, programs and handed out Bibles. The outsourcing of the hearts and minds component of, 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 uh, of, of the Central American wars to the evangelical right had two critical consequences. Uh, first, it furthered the transformation of the Republican Party into a populist party, uh, dependent on, a, on an expansive militarist foreign policy in order to hold all of the diverse constituencies that gave it its energy and support together. And second, the increasing involvement of evangelicals, uh, conservative evangelicals in, in, in foreign policy, in, in particularly in Central America, provided the gathering uh, Reagan revolution the, op the opportunity to confront directly the, uh, the, uh, the skepticism and creeping humanism that was infecting America's political culture. 
Over the last couple of years, there's been a number of books that have, uh, have sought to kind of account for the rise of America's religious right, of the United States' religious right, which most, most of them focusing on domestic issues, cultural issues, and ignoring the importance of foreign policy. Um, around the 2004 presidential campaign, uh, there seemed to be a consensus that if value issues, such as gay rights or abortion rights, could be spun into innocuous language, conservative evangelicals uh, could be convinced into to voting for a centrist Democrat with multilateral sympathies who would defend what's left of the New Deal. I think this view ignores the central role that the intellectual leadership of the, of the religious right played, not just in remoralizing mil uh, militarism, as I discussed earlier, but remoralizing the free market absolutism that underwrites it. And again, I think the, centri the, key, the experience of Central America is key. The, the Central American left, and in many ways the Latin American left in other countries more broadly that Reagan fought against, was motivated as much by Catholic liberation theology, a current of Christianity which sought to align the church with the poor and advocated a redistribution of wealth in order to to achieve social justice as much as it was by Marxism. At the same time, uh, domestic opposition in the US to Reagan's Central American policy, much more than the protests against the Vietnam War, was noticeably Christian. Groups such as the Religious Task Force on El Salvador, the Ecumenical Program on Central America and the Caribbean, the US Catholic Co Conference, Witness for Peace, the Quakers, the National Council of Churches, actively mobilized hundreds of thousands of Christians to oppose aid to the Contras or aid to El Salvador and Guatemala. It was a shared hostility to this, uh, to this peace Christianity, this Christian humanism that united mainstream conservative Protestants and, 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 and pulpit-thumping fundamentalists. In other words, well before neoconservatives and the Christian right teamed up to fight radical Islam, liberal Christianity, Christian humanism, was, was the political religion that united the new right. Uh, take the Institute on Religion and Democracy, for example. Today, the neoconservative institute is a key player in the Bush coalition. It works hard to discredit liberal religious organizations that oppose Bush's wars. Two of its theologians, Michael Novak and Richard Newhouse, have provided the White House with key theological justification for its militarist foreign policy. The Institute on Religion and Democracy, it turns out, was, was, was founded in 1981 by intellectuals associated uh, with the American Enterprise Institute, and it was advised by PR firms contracted by the White House. It was part of that Office of Public Diplomacy nexus that I talked about earlier. Its mission was, was, was initially to provide mainstream uh, religious support for Reagan's Central American policy, even to kind of present a liberal face in support of uh, Reagan's Central American policy. Yet it immediately allied with uh, evangelicals like Jimmy Swaggart, Jerry Forwell, and Pat Robinson to take on liberation theology. Uh, looking back, it's, it's, it's amazing it's how much of Michael Novak's early writings was concerned, was obsessed with liberation theology. Novak, along with others at the Institute on Religion and Democracy, sought to elaborate a set of ideals specific to the free market that could complement their understanding of the Christian understanding of free will. In particular, Novak dedicated much of his work to challenging liberation theology's insistence that third world poverty, or that, that poverty and, and, and inequality in Latin America could, could be blamed on ex economic exploitation by the first world. Uh, he argued instead that Latin America's economic backwardness must be blamed on what he identified as cultural factors specific to uh, its Spanish Catholic heritage. Uh, as did mainstream co-religionists, as did their mainstream co-religionists, fundamentalists began to formulate their free market moralism as a quarrel with liberation theology. John Rush Dooney, for example, the founder of Christian Reconstructionism, the influential branch of the evangelical movement that seeks to replace the Constitution with biblical law, uh, described liberation theology as what he called uh, the economics of Satan. And another evangelical economist called it a, quote, the theology of mass murder, the single most critical problem that Christianity has faced in all of its 2,000 year history. 
Now, where liberation theology held that humans could fully, could fully realize their potential here on earth, evangelical economists argued that attempts to distribute wealth and regulate production was based on an incorrect understanding of society, an understanding that incited disobedience to proper authority by high, highlighting economic inequality. They held that the profit motive, rather than being an amoral economic mechanism, was part of a divine plan to make fallen, to discipline fallen, fallen man and make him produce. Uh, and here again, we see a kind of um, we, we see a kind of coming together of the different branches of the new right. Uh, one of the projects of the new right is to kind of uh, move away of a celebration of a kind of defense of order and hierarchy and status, of the status hierarchy, and a kind of celebration of the market as a site of creativity. So the secular, secular branch of the new right would celebrate the market as, a, as a, this, the kind of more kind of secular uh, aspects of the creative, uh, creative potential of the market. But here we see the kind, of, uh, the, the kind of religious face of that, the evangelical face of that. As did Michael Novak, evangelicals sought to rebut liberation theology's critique of the global political economy. According to evangelical Ronald Nash, uh, third world poverty has what he called, quote, a cultural, moral, and even religious dimension that reveals itself in a lack of respect for private property and a high leisure preference. I like that high leisure preference. <laughs> now, some took this argument to its logical conclusion. Uh, Gary North, another influential evangelical economist, insisted that, quote, third the third world's problems were religious, uh, moral perversity, a long history of demonism and outright paganism. The citizens of the third world, he wrote, ought to fall on their knees and repent from their godless, rebellious, socialistic ways. They should feel guilty because they are guilty both individually and collectively. Now, evangelical Christianity's elaboration of a, the a theological justification for free market capitalism, along with its view of an immoral third world, resonated with other ideological currents within the Third Reich. The Third, uh, third not the Third Reich. <laughs> Sorry, I meant the new right, <laughs> third right. Uh, uh, thus laying the ground, f groundwork for today's embrace of empire as, 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 uh, as, as the United States' national pr uh, purpose. In a universe of free will where, uh, where good work is rewarded and bad work punished, the very fact of American prosperity was considered a self-evident confirmation of God's blessing of U.S. power in the world. Third world misery, in contrast, was, was proof of what, of what evangelicals, conservative evangelicals, often described as God's curse. Uh, David Chilton, uh, another member of the Reconstructionist branch and, uh, and uh, one of the founders of the Institute for Christian Economics, wrote that poverty is how, quote, God controls heathen cultures they must spend so much of their time surviving that they're unable to exercise ungodly dominion over the earth. And again, this is all specifically uh, articulated, specifically elaborated in, in reference to, to, to the developing world and oftentimes specifically the Latin America. Uh, Novak and Michael Novak and John Newhouse, of course, would not use such stock terms, but the sentiment is, 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 is but a step removed from their logic. Uh, after all, the Institute of, of Religion and Democracy's mission statement, written by Newhouse, uh, anointed America, the United States, to be the, quote, primary bearer of the democratic possibility in the world today. And such an opinion nestles uh, very comfortably with the evangelical notions that the United States is a redeemer nation. And I think it saturates uh, much of uh, George Bush's foreign policy pronouncements. Uh, the religious right sense of itself as a persecuted uh, people, as engaged in a life and death end time struggle between the forces of good and evil, mapped, mapped easily onto the absolutism of anti-communist militarists, uh, particularly those involved in Central America. Uh, in confronting a common threat, Christian humanism, theological distinctions that separated evangelicals from Catholics, say, uh, broke down, paving the way for a transnational and transdenominational religious right. Uh, many of the militarists who executed the Contra War or, or were involved in El Salvador and Guatemala, uh, John Singlab, CIA uh, Director William Casey, Oliver North, were themselves members of either uh, Protestant or, or ultra-conservative Catholic sects, 
uh, the charismatic church of the apostles. Uh, Oliver North was a member of Opus Dei and the Knights of Malta. Uh, Catholic William Casey, uh, again, the CIA director, attended mass daily, and his, mansions were reportedly, his mansion was reportedly filled with statues of the Virgin Mary. It's kind of like a Central American Da Vinci Code or something. Uh, throughout the 1980s, as its involvement in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala deepened, fundamentalists came to share with Reaganite neoconservatives a common set of assumptions about the world and the United States' role in it. The U.S. had grown dangerously weak, and when neoconservatives called for a renewal of political will, evangelicals believed that America's revival uh, would come, through, uh, come about through spiritual rebirth. Working closely with neoconservative po policy intellectuals such as Elliot Abrams, Otto Reich, Robert Kagan, Jean Kirkpatrick, conservative evangelical theologians established a moral justification for Reagan's rehabilitation of militarism. They aligned their theology to incorporate elements of both the idealism and the realism that I talked about earlier, the kind of that, that, dang, that mix which led us straight to war in Iraq and today makes torture a central tool in what they understand to be a civil, civil, civilizational mission. Now, not all in the religious right has, have, have, who, back, who backed Reagan's Central American wars followed Bush across the Rubicon. Some, such as Phyllis Shafley, have remained true to, to the isolationist faith. But increasingly in the 1980s, evangelical intellectuals began to link their understanding of biblical fulfillment more directly to the fortunes of a remilitarized US state. Our government wrote Jerry Forwell in 1980, but sounding a lot like George Bush in 2002, quote, has the right to use its armaments to bring wrath upon those who would do evil by hurting other people, unquote. And not just defensively, but preemptively. Uh, evangelical Russ Walton in 1988, even as the Cold War was winding down and the Soviet Union was imploding, wrote that we must go on the offensive. Now, the violence of counterinsurgent wars stoked the, fi the fires of fundamentalist Manichaeism, leading Forwell, Robinson, and others to al ally with the worst murderers and torturers in Central America and in Latin America and South America. Robinson described the genocide carried out by Guatemala's Efrayan Rios Mont as, quote, a miracle. This was a genocide in 1981, 1983, called it a miracle. Along with more than a dozen uh, Christian New Right organizations, the moral majority uh, heralded the murder of, of Salvadoran Archbishop Oscar Romero as a hero, presenting him with a, with a plaque honoring his, quote, continuing efforts for freedom. Uh, one power life minister, uh, lectured his uh, flock of Salvadoran soldiers that killing for the joy of it was wrong, but killing before it was necessary, because it was necessary to fight an antichrist system. Communism was not only right, but a duty of every Christian. Uh, so when Jean Kirkpatrick remarked in 1980 that the three US nuns, she famously made this remark uh, after the three US nuns and, and one lay worker, were raped, mutilated, and murdered by Salvadoran security forces. She famously said that they were, quote, not just nuns, they were political activists. Uh, she was being more than cruel. She was signaling a disapproval of a particular kind of uh, peace Christianity and sounding the ba battle cry in the, in the New Right's first religious crusade. Now, taken each on their own, the ideas, the tactics, and the politics, and the economics that have defined Bush's global foreign policy, global policy, are not new. An, interven an interventionist military posture fueled by a belief that America, that the United States has a special role in the play in world history, has driven US diplomacy uh, in one way or another for nearly two, two centuries. But what is new I think, is, is how these elements have been distilled into a particularly potent concoction and, the, and bound tightly to the ambition of the United States' domestic ruling conservative coalition, a coalition that despite its power and influence postures itself as persecuted at odds uh, not just with much of the world but with modern life itself. Uh, America's position in, in, in the world's political economy demands an aggressive foreign policy. On this fact, neither the Democrats or the Republicans uh, disagree. But the need for the Republicans to maintain a, a constant level of mobilization in order to hold its coalition together, especially since so many of the goals 
of, of, of its constituencies are unattainable could push uh, this aggression to an even more dangerous extreme. I think, therefore, to, 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 to focus on exclusively on neoconservative intellectuals as much of, as the writing attempting to identify the origins of the Bush Doctrine does misses the power of, of, of the kind of social movement that stands behind uh, the Bush Doctrine. The intellectual architects of, of, of uh, George Bush's preemptive warfare doctrine are but part of a larger resurgence of nationalist militarism and serving as a kind of ideologues of American revanchism fueled by a kind of lethal combination of humiliation in Vietnam and then vindication in the Cold War of which they see Central America as, 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 the, as, the, as the important lesson to take away from how they believe they won the Cold War by unleashing and rehabilitating American militarism. I guess I'd like to end by coming back to uh, the, the, the reference of the, the rise of the Latin American left again and, and the kind of return of, of, of these movements within Latin America trying to get a little distance from US power, try to break out of the kind of uh, uh, thrall of, of US domination. Right? Because US power in the world has long been predicated on claiming Latin America as its own. And so what we're seeing now, I think, is, is Latin America kind of breaking, breaking free of that system, that old system crumbling, crumbling and coming apart. At the same time, the US is actually meeting, is actually have, is, 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 in, in, is in, in embedded in this, in this probably one of the most ruinous and disastrous war, just not in terms of morality, just in terms of US interests in the Middle East. Historically, in the 20th century, twice when the U.S. Uh, failed to project its power and was, was pushed back either in the 1930s as a result of the contraction of the Depression or being, or being kicked out of Southeast Asia, being defeated in Vietnam, it turned back to Latin America to regroup. Therefore, I think the metaphor uh, of Latin America being uh, the United States' backyard doesn't quite work. I like to think of it more as a strategic reserve where the United States, whenever it kind of suffers setbacks, turns to kind of redraw and regather its power. In 1930s and 1940s, what we saw was a kind of establishment of, of what political scientists like to call soft power. It's where the United States, through the good neighbor policy, worked out the institutions and ideas associated with liberal multilateralism, which after World War II, it then projected globally uh, and, and, and used to attain superpower status. After getting kicked out of Southeast Asia, the new right turns to Latin America and, uh, and, 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 and to, to, to sweep away that liberal multilateralism and rehabilitate what political scientists like to call hard power, hard power with a vengeance. And now it's projecting it on a global scale. Now that that project is in ruins, I guess the question is, what's next? I think we, we may be at a moment, a particularly combustible moment with the United States. We'll see what, what foreign policy establishment emerges out of the disaster of this one and what the role of Latin America as it's seeking to establish a bit of autonomy and independence plays. So I'll just end there and open it up. I guess we're gonna have questions or? I can't really see. Anything. Do you want to feel them? Because I can't really see. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, you obviously can't see me, but um, uh, I really liked your presentation. Oh, you. And um, uh, I pretty much agree with most of what you said. But what, what leaves me stumped after hearing it um, is I well, it's sort of two things. I don't understand why. Like, I mean, I, I understand you're saying that these people believe in these, you know, these radical ideologies, whether they be free market or whether they be, you know, uh, religious. But it seems like you're talking about pretty much like 20 people, you know? <laughs> and I'm not kidding. And this is what Cy Hirsch says consistently, that he talks about the, the US government being taken over by a group of like 20 people. And I'm wondering if, if, so now to my question, right? Considering that it's only like 20 people, is this why they, um, assuming you agree with that, but is this, is this why uh, 
they ignore North Korea and they ignore South America now because they're, they're literally only 20 people and they can only handle one thing at a time? <laughs> I, uh, I guess I would back up a little bit and say I don't, I guess I don't really agree with that. I guess the point I was trying to make was the, the opposite, that it's not about a neoconservative cabal that, um, that the, thinking about the rise of the conservative movement as one of the most powerful social movements that the U.S. has ever witnessed. And the power of that movement comes from, that it draws its energy from different, at times contradictory constituencies that have strong grassroots support and different factors. And in many, it, yes, on, on some level, it's, 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 a, it's the intellectuals of these movements, the, if you want to use the term organic intellectuals, whatever term you want to use, but that, that, that are articulating these ideas in their most pronounced form. But I think that the, there's a deep, there's a, the, the, the backlash and the reaction to the liberalization of the 60s, which corresponded also to a, to a kind of rise of this revanchist movement out to avenge Vietnam, uh, was, is quite powerful. And it goes well beyond the ideas of 20, 20 neoconservative intellectuals and a small cabal, that, that there are points of affinity which have deep resonance within American nationalism and within U.S. nationalism, and which, which, uh, which is what gives it its power. And, and, and what, we've, what we saw in the 1980s is that, is that there was a kind of articulation of a number of different currents all in the Republican Party. The Republican Party becomes the ascendant party, and it becomes the dominant party because it's able to tap into this. And, and the, its electoral fortunes are also, are also tied into maintaining an aggressive foreign policy. It can all, increasingly, and it seems, it seems increasingly clear that it can only win through national security, that, that you know, even though these other consti constituencies are powerful on its own right, what really does hold it together is, a, is an aggressive foreign policy. So I guess I wouldn't really, I guess I wouldn't agree that it was 20 people. Well, I think I think there's real strategic reasons why the Middle East. It goes that's where it goes beyond ideology. This is where ideology and interests. I mean, the Middle East is is much more. I mean, oil. I mean, I think I think it's not just ideology. Even though I do focus, I do think ideology is incredibly important to understand how interests are understood. But I think that the, it is the Middle East because because it is the Middle East because that's that is ge geopolitically and economically crucial to the maintenance of, of of U.S. power and they know that. I mean, even the I mean, if you go back and look at Paul Wolfowitz's uh, early stuff, and I, I mean, not early stuff in, in terms of the Reagan years, but in 1991 when he wrote those, uh, when he was with the policy planning, when he wrote those policy planning guidelines, and it was and and and, and it was a lot, it was another one of these documents was, that was too radical at the time. It's all about oil. It's not about spreading democracy. So I think it is the Middle East for a very, in some ways, very obvious reasons. But it is a place where I think ideology and interests have have kind of come together into it. Okay, I'm, I'm in the light now. I don't know if it helps you see me. Yeah, I see. <laughs> um, seems very loud. I really appreciated your remarks and your research and really grateful that you came here and the committee uh, selected you to come and all. Uh, and uh, I suppose for some of our audience, given the conservatism of this area of the country, they might just be completely blown away and astounded and not have a a clue about some of the things that you've said because it's so different from mainstream thought in this area. <laughs> but, uh, but for me, it was very, very, very useful. And I wanted, I have two questions. Um, uh, one is, without you doing a whole other talk, I'm just sort of wondering how you would explain the jump from the 80s and the, uh, the connection with Central America and everything, which I think you, you explained very well. To the, to the Bush administration, what kind of, what happened maybe institutionally, br very briefly, in between with the Clinton administration, and didn't that have any, didn't that slow any of this down, or am I completely idealistic about No, that? no, it did, and it's not just the Clinton administration. This coalition that I talk about starts to break up in the first Bush, the Bush senior administration. I mean, the, the religious right thought him to be way too Atlanticist, way too Northeastern. Uh, I mean, the, the, the phrase New World Order, I mean, if you go back and read Pat Robinson's stuff, I mean, they saw the New World Order as the UN, you know, black helicopters, jack boots marching in to, you know, take sovereignty or, or, or from the heartland. I mean, they, 
they were very much opposed to, in many ways to, to, to the first Bush administration's foreign policy. Um, and then the Clinton administration, obviously. A couple of things start to happen. One is that the increasing engagement by the evangelical right in world affairs continues, even though it's not directly linked to, the, to, the, to, to political power. Uh, they deepen their ties in the Middle East. They deepen their involvement in, in Latin America and in Africa. Uh, it becomes much more expansive. It's not, it's not, it's, you know, a lot of, in, in some ways, the, the, the evangelical right is the, are the United States as true internationalists. They're the ones that are pushing on a range of issues, not just, you know, backing Israel and, 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 and the bombing of Lebanon, but, but malaria and sex trafficking and, and, and slavery and, Poverty reduction. I mean, the, you know, people like Sam Brown back in Kansas and Frank Wolf in Virginia are, in some ways, the, the true internationalists in the Congress. That continues. What happens with with Clinton? Obviously, there's that kind of neoliberal moment where where it's a it's it's a different it's a different kind of a model of projection of U.S. power. It's but it's but it's but it's it's more the kind of free market multilateral through multilateral institutions. But what Clinton does is that he. For, for whatever reason, either because the Democrat, because, but he starts to expand the, it's under him that the expansion of the, mil, the role of the military, right? It's, it's Madeleine Albright, Clinton's Secretary of Defense, who tell, asked Colin Powell, what's the point of having this military if we don't use it? And, and, and Colin Powell doesn't have an answer to that. And, and, that, and, that, and, that, and Clinton deploys the military just in terms of number of times more, uh, more than every other president from, Truman to Reagan combined. Now, obviously, Vietnam and Korea and, 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 and uh, were much on a different scale than, than Bosnia and, and, and uh, the Congo, but, but it was just a, a ex an expansion and a willingness to use the military for a range of issues not, not directly linked to national security. It was under Clinton that the, that the idea of national security balloons into global security. So what happens after 9-11, I think, is that the coalition and constituencies that I'm talking about come back with a vengeance. And what Bush does is he, he inherit, I mean, Bush inherited, I mean, Bush, George Bush runs, runs against Clinton's expansive foreign policy. If you remember in, in, in 1999, 2000, that campaign was about him criticizing, we have to have a modest, we have to have a humble foreign policy. So he goes from that to a post-September 9-11 uh, plan to rid the world of evil with the military. And I think what, what Bush does is he kind of takes all of that and he latches it more tightly to a kind of nationalism that is much more at home within the Republican Party as a result of this, as opposed to that kind of internationalism that, 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 that is represented by the, by, the, by the Clinton administration. But so all of this stuff that I'm talking about doesn't go away, but it, it, it takes different shapes at specific historical conjunctions linked to events like 9-11. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question, and we'll take a short break before the uh, Jewels of Nature. I'll let, should, yes. I mean, okay. Do you okay. okay. Um, I'm one of those people that was really involved in the sanctuary movement and, and a lot of the bridging, trying to bridge uh, between the U.S. Um, power and being kind of just... Um, just not knowing what was going on in the rest of the world, kind of bridge that a little bit, learn and build partnerships. And I'm still involved in a now a, a relationship and building a communication with an understanding with the Mayan village and what, you know, the whole terror trauma that occurred in Guatemala and Central America. So, you know, in continuing that road, um, uh, we want, you know, to do that. But uh, for example, our church, church group had, and I know several other groups have been wanting to make trips there and have been, you know, various people have looked up in the state, you know, looked State Department reports and found out that there's all this uh, terror and violence that are inflicted upon Americans, so therefore it's unsafe to go. And I guess my question would be, are we being discouraged by our government perhaps to have any relationship with these uh, communities in Latin America? The question is, is that like a... Well, because a, it feels as if they're, you know, along with all of what you're saying, are we, you know, I guess I fear that, that we're, that there's war brewing below the border and that we're actually being conditioned to, to think that there's a lot more danger going on down there than, 
Yeah. You know, and discouraged from I, I interaction. You mean so State Department alerts about travel yes. warnings? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I doubt that it's that cal that those are that calculated. I mean, okay. they, they. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm too naive. But they. they I, I mean, they probably seem to reflect a rise of criminal. You know, yeah, some real fear. Right. Okay. Yeah. But maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm just naive. Is that? Should we just ask what have one okay. more question? I think I oh, sorry. You're in charge. <laughs> oh. um, the last comment uh, you were making closing your uh, your um, lecture, I find very interesting. Uh, and so, if you can expand now, maybe in conversation later. But it's it's a bit ironic that the good neighbor policy. Uh, of, of the um, Roosevelt administration and Truman, etc. Ironically, it was the kind of foreign policy that led to the establishment of many of the dictatorial regimes, if not to sustain them, like the Somozas, etc. And it's after the 80s, as a result of the conflicts that you mentioned, which are also part, and I don't think should be taken away from the context of the Cold War, and also, as part of that, uh, Cuba's very aggressive foreign policy in Central America. As a result of that, then what you have is, is a process of democratization that lends to today's populism, while at the same time, a shift in, in the old left in Latin America, which becomes uh, uh, legalized. They go through the via uh, uh, of the electoral process, mm -hmm. and Montoneros and yeah. all of those groups. So it's kind of uh, interesting to, to me that, that that soft power policy of the 40s and the 50s actually helped sustain American interest dictatorial yeah. uh, regimes in Central America. That's a great question, and it's often used. Uh, you know, a lot of people often say, uh, you know, the problem of Latin of the U.S. and Latin America is an intervention. It's not enough intervention, and they often hold up somebody like. Somoza in, in uh, some Somoza in Nicaragua, Trujillo in, in, in the Dominican Republic, as as examples of this. The centerpiece of the good neighbor policy is the pledge of non-intervention. That's the you know it's not the good neighbor policy is just a general uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna treat Latin Americans with respect. There's actually you know a, a legal revolution, a juridical revolution in diplomacy that this, the good neighbor policy represents, and that's the U.S.'s pledge of absolute non-intervention in the internal domestic affairs of uh, Latin American nations. And um, a lot of people hold that up as, as, as giving rise to people like Somoza or Trujillo. I, I guess I would dispute that. Uh, the rise of dictatorships in, in Latin America after World War II, I think, is directly linked not to the good neighbor policy, but to the, to the hollowing out of the good neighbor policy in 1947, when the State Department signals a clear shift and makes a clear shift that its preference is for stability rather than for democracy. Part of this has to do with the Cold War, the rising Cold War and its geopolitical interests. Part of it has to do with its economic interests, because there's all sorts of mobilization, union mobilization and peasant mobilization that happens after World War, World War II. Um, basically, it's the, the characterization that the good neighbor policy generates dictatorships is just not true. Uh, from 1944 to 1946, almost every Latin, every Latin American country except five either saw either transition to democracy or deepen the democracy that they already had. Every country, I think, except Paraguay, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Dominican Republic, and, and uh, and maybe Honduras. From 1947 to 1948, the dawning of the Cold War, all of those rever all of those gains are reversed. There's a continental reaction that's that in which that's a confluence of U.S. geopolitical interests and the interests of domestic Latin American elites that take advantage of the rhetoric of the Cold War to roll back that democratic opening. What you see happening now is not so much, I think since the end of the Cold War isn't so much a transition to democracy as a transition to a particular form of democracy. Latin America's first transition to democracy, I would argue, was this 1944 to 1946 period, which understood democracy not just in terms of political rights, but an expansion of economic rights. That it wasn't just about political liberties, but it was about social security, it was about the right to unionize, it was about, it was about a whole host of social and economic rights that are embedded. You can look at the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights uh, all of that stuff, all of those social rights that the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 proclaim are all the direct result of Latin American jurists who delegates to the UN Convention which demand that these social and economic rights be included. 
This is the first transition to democracy, and, and that's what gets shut down, not as a result of the good neighbor policy, but a, a result not to give all power to the U.S., but one of the key things is the State Department in 1947 specifically signaling that it is no longer concerned with democracy, it's concerned with stability, and that allows domestic Latin American elites to basically launch a, a continental a continental reaction against the first transition to democracy. What we see with the transition to democracy in the 1980s in many ways is a very specific form of democracy, one which tries to emphasize political rights, uh, cultivate a, a passive citizenry, uh, kind of leave behind Latin America's kind of populist Jacobin tradition and emphasize not economic equality, but economic growth, all of the kind of uh, the kind of democracy very much associated with neoliberalism. So I guess I would I, I would I would disagree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Right. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I think the good neighbor policy. I mean, there's two phases of the good neighbor policy. There's one where where it's actually trying to be implemented. You know, this, even at, from its beginning, there's all sorts of violation. Roosevelt intervenes in Cuba and all of this stuff. But there's a, there's, a, there's a serious commitment to democracy, and there's a serious commitment to social democracy and a willingness of the United States to tolerate economic nationalism in Latin America. After 1947, the language of the good neighbor policy stays into place, but, but there's a clear shift. And, and, and so, I mean, the U.S.'s intervention in Guatemala in 1954 is, is justified under the language of the good neighbor policy, right? So it's all of this, you know, the, the good neighbor policy is hollowed out and, and it continues in name, in name even, even, as, even as it's kind of eroded uh, from within in the play, right? So there's a, there's a shift. So I would, I, would, I would blame more the persistence of, of dictatorships not on the good neighbor policy per se, but the United States is kind of gutting the good neighbor policy. Okay, thanks a lot, Craig.